2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. One more time. We are taking a little break from our series on 1 Timothy. And we just want to take a look at this passage one more time. This is God's word. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Last week, I didn't get to share all that I hoped to share, and the conversation I had with some of you afterwards reinforced that sentiment. So I'd like to spend one more week on this passage, mainly thinking about the practical implications of what we shared last week. Last week, we said that God destined us for glory. How do you feel about that? Are you excited and grateful for this provision from God? Maybe or maybe not. Glory may not be what you think about very much, and I don't blame you. Long gone are the days when children used to say, when asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they used to say, I want to be president. There were cultures that valued glory above all. Men were willing to risk all, including their lives, to attain glory. They would rather die a glorious death than go on living an ignominious life. But it seems like people these days don't talk about glory much. They want to be well known and well off. They want to experience unique things that they can videotape and upload to their social media and have a ton of likes. From food and exotic locations to extreme sports and activities. So what Paul says in today's passage may not thrill us much. But I want to ask you, what do you pray for these days? For glory or for comfort? What is glory? What does Paul present? Why does Paul present the glory of the Lord as the ultimate object of our vision? Why does he describe our salvation in terms of being transformed from shame and guilt to glory? And that from glory to glory. The root idea of glory is weightiness. It is something that cannot be treated lightly. There's something so sublime about it that we cannot be casual or flippant in its presence. Yet there is something profoundly attractive about glory too. Some of you might have seen gravity visualized on YouTube. A professor fastens a big, big sheet of spandex on a big drum. And as he puts a good-sized metal ball on the sheet, he says, matter warps time and space. And when he rolls smaller balls on the sheet, they orbit around the bigger ball and eventually fall into the curvature created by the bigger ball. That's gravity. Weightiness attracts. The heavier it is, the stronger its attraction is. The glory of God, who is the weightiest being of all, not physically, but metaphysically speaking, by the way, 
God should be the most attractive being of all. It is only right that we should be drawn to God's glory above all else. So there is something very aberrational and abominable about human beings attracted to anything more than God and His glory. Nothing should attract us more than the glory of the Lord, especially because we are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of the most glorious God. We are made for glory, to delight in the glory of our Maker and reflect His glory in our being and in our conduct. What is your heart drawn to these days, even at this very moment? That is why Paul describes our redemption in terms of being transformed from glory to glory. The way we go through this transformation is by beholding the glory of Christ by faith. So Jesus told Martha in front of Lazarus' tomb, Did, you, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? We are to see the glory of God by faith. We cannot behold the glory of the Lord without faith, that is, without being born again and raised with Jesus Christ from death to new life. As we saw last week, those who are spiritually dead cannot behold the glory of Christ, nor do they want to. In fact, if they, if they beheld the glory of Christ, they would be destroyed. Think about Isaiah. In his vision, he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He saw this. He also saw the seraphim calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And what was his response to this vision? Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Think about it, he was a prophet of Israel. And this was what happened when he beheld the glory of God. Even the seraphim had to cover their eyes in the presence of God, even though they were sinless and glorified angels in heaven. If that is the case, how can unrepentant sinners behold the Lord and bear the heat of his wrath? For God is a consuming fire to sinners. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. If these unrepentant sinners can go on living their merry lives, it is only because they are blithely blind to the glory of the Lord. Their hearts are hardened, verse 14. They have eyes to see but see not. Ears to hear, but hear not, Ezekiel 12, 2. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. God is allowing them to live in their blindness because their sins are not yet full, and the time of their judgment has not yet come. But when that time comes... God will remove his hand of common grace and expose the full weight of his glory before them. Then they will cry out, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. They are saying this to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us, mountains and rocks. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the day, great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Revelation 6, 16 and 17. 
When you think about this, how amazing it is that we will behold the glory of the Lord face to face someday without being undone. But even now, the Bible assures us that we can behold the glory of the Lord without being destroyed by God, who is a consuming fire. How is that possible? It is only because Jesus bore the fiery wrath of God on the cross on our behalf. That is why Jesus cried out, I thirst, as he bore the heat of the lake of fire in hell in our place. So complete was Jesus' sacrificial death for our sins. So perfect was Jesus' flawless life of obedience for our righteousness that we can behold the glory of Christ and not die. In fact, beholding the glory of the Lord is our greatest consolation in times of affliction. It fills us with life instead of bringing us down with distress and despair. It transforms us from glory to glory instead of burying us in the mire of shame and guilt, all because of Christ. But for now, we behold the glory of Christ by faith, not by sight. So Paul says, for now, we see in a mirror dimly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. The Greek word for dimly is enigma, from which we get the word enigma. John Owen points out, we have this view not directly, but reflexively, and by way of a representation as in a glass. For I take the glass here, uh, uh, glass here to be a glass which reflects an image of what we do behold. It is a sight like that which we have of a man in a glass when we see not his person or substance, but an image or representation of him. This is so because it is all we can bear as long as we still live in our fallen bodies with our souls not yet glorified. Our present condition cannot bear the joy and thrill of seeing the glory of the Lord face to face. You know, when people are so happy and joyous, they break down and cry because their bodies cannot handle the joy. If an earthly joy does that to our bodies, imagine what, it's like, what it would be like to see the glory of Christ in his fullness. We need a resurrection body to handle, handle that joy. But I must hasten to add that none of us have caught a full glimpse even of the dim image of Christ. If faith is the instrument by which we behold the glory of the Lord, how clear our vision of his glory depends on the strength of our faith. But none of us have perfect faith, a faith that is untainted by any degree of doubt or uncertainty, a faith that is not subject to waxing and waning, a faith that cannot grow anymore because it is fully mature. This is not to say that our faith is not genuine. Something can be genuine without being perfect. A diamond may not be perfect in its shape, but it is still genuine. We are all genuine human beings, even though we may not be perfect men and perfect women. Our faith can be small, but genuine. Jesus said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the, in the sea, and it would obey you, Luke 17, 6. But if that is true, it is only because there is, it's not because there is anything magical about our faith. Rather, it is because of the one in whom we placed our faith. 
and he is great. What does it profit a person to have the greatest faith in the world if he trusted something false? If we are transformed from glory to glory by beholding the glory of the Lord, it is only because the glory of Christ is such that it transforms all those who bask in his effulgent light. Can the moon not shine when it receives the sunlight? Can the sunflower not lift its face toward the sun when the sun passes through the sky? The glory of Christ is infectious to those who behold him in faith. When, he, when we behold the glory of the Lord by faith, we cannot not change. But the degree of our transformation depends on the strength of our faith. So it is no surprise that there are varying degrees and intensities of change among us, as there is a difference between the moon reflecting the sunlight and the mirror reflecting the sunlight. Why is the moon's reflection of the sunbeam not so bright? Because it is made up of many elements that are not conducive to reflecting the light. A guilt-ridden and unclean heart. A heart smudged with habitual and unrepentant sins. A heart that is filled with the love of the world will have a blurred and obscured vision of Christ. But a heart that is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and restored by genuine repentance, a heart that is Godward, Christ-centered, and heavenly-minded will have a much clearer vision of Christ. When we see Christ face-to-face -face on that glorious day of our resurrection, we will reflect his glory not as the moon, but maybe as a spotless mirror without any blemish. If so, how brilliant we will shine in his glorious presence. What is the condition of your heart now? How clear is your vision of Christ? Is there any way we can find out? Here's one way to tell, and it is ironic. If you're deeply convicted by this message, feeling sorrowful about the unclean condition of your heart, most likely you are the one with a clean heart and a clear vision of Christ. The pure light of Christ exposes even the smallest of our sins and flaws. Your heart is stricken with grief because you have grieved your loving Savior. And you cry out to the Lord to cleanse you and make you whole in Christ. All these things you are able to see because your heart has already been cleansed because the light of His glory is shining upon you. But if you are not convicted by this message, and feel quite satisfied with your spiritual condition, you probably don't have a clear vision of Christ. I'm not saying that you, sh I'm not saying that you should feel convicted because my sermon is so great. Far from it. But a clean heart can hear the voice of God even in the heartless preaching of Jonah to the Ninevites or the crowing of a rooster. An unclean heart will hear the voice of Christ himself and mock his message, just as a person with dull vision can look directly into the sun and not, not be bothered very much. Your blindness to spiritual reality has put you at a fatal ease. Some of you may know that your hearts are unclean. You cannot think of the last time you had a glimpse of Christ and rejoiced. But tragically, you don't care very much. Not enough to do anything about it. You assume that there will be another time. 
Now is not the time for you, you think. And you ignore the Lord knocking on your hearts so he can go in and sup with you. If so, listen carefully to what John Owen said. Consider, therefore, Christ's infinite condescension. That's an old language. It means coming down to be with you. Consider his infinite condescension, grace, and love here in the gospel. Why all this towards you? Does he stand in need of you? Have you deserved it at his hands? Did you love him first? Can he not be happy and blessed without you? Has he any design upon you that he is so earnest in calling you unto him? Alas, it is nothing but the overflowing of mercy, compassion, and grace that moves and acts him therein. In the contempt of this infinite condescension of Christ in his holy invitation of sinners to himself lies the sting and poison of unbelief, which unavoidably gives over the souls of men unto eternal ruin. So what do you do when your heart is unclean? Pray. Pay attention to the warning of the scriptures. How fatal the ease with which you live your life is. Pray for God's mercy even at this point and turn to Christ to behold him. Jesus promised, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. He also promised, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. He will remove your blindness and reveal himself to you. But you must ask and seek and knock at the urging of God's word. If beholding the glory of Christ is what brings about our transformation from glory to glory, it matters how often, how long, and how intently we behold Christ. There is no quality time without an ample quantity of time. Our problem is that we want quality time without spending enough time with the Lord. We give only five minutes to God in the morning for prayer and scripture reading and complain that it doesn't do anything for us and that it is a waste of time. We try reading the Bible a few times and stop because God didn't show up for us. As I mentioned last week, they say that you need 30,000 hours of focused effort to be an expert in something. Do you think that getting to know the infinite God shouldn't take that much time because it is not that important? We read in Mark 3.14, and Jesus appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Do you see? When Jesus called the 12, their primary calling was to be with him so they could learn from him by listening to him and observing him. Yes, Jesus wanted to send them out to preach eventually, but how could they preach without being with him first to learn what they should preach about? How can we be transformed from glory to glory if we do not spend time with Christ and his glory? Now when the religious leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Christ. Being with Christ was the key to their boldness 
and wisdom that astonished these well-educated religious leaders of Jerusalem. Even Jesus exemplified for us this reality in, throughout his earthly ministry. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. The son was beholding the father at every moment and everything he did because he saw the father doing what he was supposed to do. Brothers and sisters, we must move on from dating Christ to living with Christ. Dating Christ is for Sundays for an hour only. Living with Christ is for every day, every hour, every minute. Dating Christ is only for special occasions, especially when we are sad or in trouble or lonely. Living with Christ is for all occasions both in good times and bad times, both in health and sickness, both in joy and sorrow, both in life and death. Dating Christ is falling in love with what we want Christ to be. Living with Christ is falling in love with who he really is, the Christ of the Bible. Dating Christ is to have the option of breaking up, Living with Christ is living out the commitment of love through thick and thin. Dating Christ is co-piloting with Jesus. Living with Christ is living in full and joyful submission to him. The God of infinite wisdom, love, power, truth, goodness, beauty, and glory. There's nothing humiliating or shameful about submitting to the God of infinite wisdom and glory. It is the most right thing to do. It's the wisest thing to do. To be under his sovereign rule of wisdom and care and love for you. So how should we live a life of constant, intentional beholding of the glory of Christ in the coming week? I think you know what you need to do. You need to read the Bible. Some of you need to start reading it instead of saying, Maybe later, maybe later. Some of you need to read it more regularly. And some of you need to read it more. You need to study it, not just read it. The Bible is not something you can just read casually and understand. I hope you could take advantage of the midweek Bible studies that we are offering. What are the reasons that you do not participate? Are those reasons insurmountable? What do you think God will say about those reasons? You also need to meditate on what you learn so you can digest it to be part of you. The Bible is not just for knowing or being familiar with, it is for living. So commit the Bible verses that touch you to memory so you can recall them anytime for reminder, encouragement, and strength. Listen to Christian music and read Christian books. Try fasting from consuming the worldly stuff. Some of them can be very helpful, but if you are not in the right frame of mind by communing with Christ, you cannot discern what is good and bad. You cannot do that unless your mind and heart are in tune with God's mind and heart. You may delight in worthless stuff and despise 
the good stuff. And be mindful of God at all times. Constantly talk with God instead of just talking to yourself. When something happens, don't just react. Don't waste what God is doing in your life. Pray to God instead, instead of just talking to yourself. Dear God, I'm so happy. Thank you. God, I'm so mad. Help me not to do something foolish and sinful. Give me the wisdom to know what you are doing and how I can be a blessing in this situation. God, this is really, really difficult. Help me to look to you as my strength and persevere in hope and not grow weary in doing good. There is a very thin line between just complaining and praying. You can turn your complaint into prayer. I hope you know how impossible this is to do. And I've done this intentionally to remind you of the high calling that God has given to you, which is impossible for us to achieve. So don't take this message as an antinomian. Those who think that the law of God has no place in our lives. Don't take it as an antinomian thinking that since this is impossible, you can just do what you, you can just do your best at your own pace. And God will be pleased with you. We are only human, right? What can God expect from us other than we do our best? No, God doesn't want your best. God wants you to live in a manner worthy of God's glorious calling to be his children bearing his name and honor. Worthy of all that God has provided for you for godliness and life. And don't take this as a legalist either. Thinking that you can do this if you try a little harder. And all the while growing bitter in your heart for this heavy cross God calls you to bear. Christ never meant it for you to bear it alone. In fact, he has already borne this cross for you. You don't have to bear it to make it to heaven with your effort or to win God's favor. You bear it because it is good for you. It is preparing you for the eternal weight of glory he has in store for you. So he says to you, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So brothers and sisters, this is what I want you to do as you go away from this worship service. Not thinking that, oh well, as long as I do my best, God is going to be happy. Or not thinking that if I try harder, I can make this. No, I want you to go away, clinging to Christ, beholding Christ with all of your might and come to him. He is not just a trophy displayed on a pedestal. He is your loving and compassionate Lord. As you lift your eyes up, as you lift your eyes of faith and behold him, you will find him beholding you. You realize that he has never taken his eyes off you. He watches over you, neither sleeps nor slumbers. Think about that poignant moment 
when Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes met in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the great priest. I wonder what he saw in Jesus' eyes. Probably so many things, I'm sure. Something that reminded him of his cowardice and utter hopelessness as a person. Denying his master at the most critical time when he needed him the most. But he also saw something that reminded him of Jesus' infinite love for him, which gave him a hope that is greater than his hopelessness. He saw in Jesus' eyes something that brought about the most heartfelt sorrow and remorse and repentance, as well as the most grateful faith in his wonderful Savior. The look of Jesus Christ can give you what you need the most at the deep core of your being. He has it all for you. People may disappoint you, but Christ will not. As you behold him with all your being, you will see yourself being transformed from glory to glory. As we behold his glory by faith, not by sight, as we behold the image of Christ dimly as through a glass, not his full substance, the glory we reflect in this life is dim as well. Paul describes our glory in this way in the next chapter. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Brothers and sisters, let us not despise this dim glory. For a day will come when we shall be glorified both in our bodies and souls, reflecting the ineffable glory of Christ no longer as the moon reflects the light, but as a mirror without any spot, pure, reflecting the light in all its purity and beauty. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for making us alive together with Christ and opening our eyes and removing the veil and removing our sin and guilt so that we can behold the glory of Christ and not be undone. Lord, we confess that we have been so attracted by so many frivolous things in this world that will perish away. Thank you for reminding us that your glory surpasses all and your glory deserves our full attention more than anything else. And thank you, Lord, that not only have you given us the privilege to behold your glory, but you are transforming us from glory to glory, by your glory. 
And thank you, Lord, that when we behold you, we see you beholding us with your infinite compassion and love and mercy and grace. If there's anyone who has not experienced and received that look of Christ, I pray, Lord, that even now your spirit would open up his eyes to see it, to see the surpassing value of Christ beholding him with his love. If we beheld it, Lord, I pray that we will long for it more and more. That we will not allow anything to come between us and Christ and his glory. And I pray, Lord, that we will be able to marvel at your glory. And as we do, that we will be transformed. And that we will marvel at the transformation of our fellow saints. As we are also transformed. And thus, help us to encourage one another. Bless your people, O oh Lord. By directing their eyes towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.